Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Megan Anderson, and I'm the Iowa State University Extension Outreach Field Agronomist that serves nine counties in central Iowa. Uh, with last week's storm, we've had a little bit of a pivot from strictly discussing uh, drought-related issues in this four-part webinar series. And so with uh, last week's episode, as well as this week's webinar, uh, we've been able to discuss uh, management implications for both uh, drought and derecho affected areas in the state. Uh, so we thank you for joining us for the last of our four-part webinar series today. Uh, before we get started, there are just a few things that I would like to mention uh, and make sure that you take note of. Uh, so first of all, I would like to make sure to thank our partners uh, in addition to Iowa State University Extension and Outreach for this webinar series. Uh, we've been able to work with the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship, especially the state climatologist, Justin, uh, as well as the Midwest Climate Hub uh, of the USDA. Uh, so we thank them for the partnership. We'd also like to thank Iowa Corn Growers Association, um, as well as the Iowa Cattlemen's Association for sponsoring it and for sharing this uh, with their networks. Uh, so I'd like to get started by welcoming Justin Glisson to uh, provide us another weather update. Um, they haven't exactly been cheery so far this year, but uh, I'm hopeful that maybe he'll have some good news for us today. So thanks for uh, getting us started here, Justin. Thanks, Megan. I'll try to give, the, give us some good news. Um, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I'm the state climatologist here for the state of Iowa uh, for the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. And today I'll be giving you a derecho update along with uh, current drought conditions as well as some uh, future outlooks moving forward into September. Okay, so the out, the outline or the highlights here today, we'll do the update on the derecho as I mentioned, and then we'll look at the current drought conditions and see how our precipitation deficits are starting to stack up um, in different parts of the state. Then we'll look at recent conditions, uh, temperatures, uh, precipitation deficits, soil moisture, uh, moisture variables of that nature. And then finally, we'll look at some outlooks in the seven day precipitation forecast. So first I wanna highlight uh, something that the National Weather Service office in the Quad Cities put together. This is the actual uh, derecho timeline. Uh, if we start uh, from the left-hand side here, an enhanced risk, so a convective outlook was uh, put out by the Storm Prediction Center about 7, 16 a.m. in the morning. And this was quickly upgraded a few hours later to a moderate risk. Uh, as conditions on the ground uh, necessitated this since the line out of uh, South Dakota into Nebraska was holding together. And then at 11.25, a pretty substantial thing happened. A particularly dangerous situation, severe thunderstorm watch was issued. I believe this is the first one of that PDS variety that's ever been issued. Typically we see these PDS uh, Watch, uh, watches put out for uh, tornado outbreaks, but this was the first for uh, thunderstorms. Then we had the first uh, uh, thunderstorm warnings for derecho moving into uh, Eastern Iowa. Now we had thunderstorm warnings from Carroll over into the Des Moines Metro anywhere from 10 to 11 a.m. So uh, the warnings were stacking up. And if you actually looked on the radar as the warnings were issued, you can see that they're starting to be issued not uh, one polygon out, but two or three. So the Weather Service recognized that this was a pretty substantial uh, event happening. Uh, so then we had uh, the Cedar Rapids area, Lynn County, Jackson County, those eastern, east central Iowa counties starting to be impacted by these winds in excess of 100 miles per hour. And I'll show, I'll show you some plots that give us an idea of those preliminary um, wind reports. So the, the line finally uh, moved out of Iowa around uh, three o'clock, 3.30, and that's when the severe thunderstorm watch was canceled. So a pretty fast moving set of events on August 10th. Again, I think I've, I've shown this plot before, but this gives you the extent spatially and temporally where the derecho formed in southern South Dakota, all the way moving into uh, Ohio. Uh, the line of the storm was 770 miles in length, and it took 14 hours to move from South Dakota into Ohio, so about 55 miles per hour um, of frontal speed. 
you'll notice that a, a good majority of those wind gusts, 65 knots and above, were located in central over to eastern Iowa. As the line moved into Illinois, it started to stretch out more, bow out, what we call a bow echo, as the rear infl inflow jet starts to push the storm forward. Um, so we, as the, as the system stretched north and south, it started to lose some steam. Again, we had some damage in Illinois, Indiana, and some in Ohio, but Iowa suffered the brunt of the derecho. Um, this is a, a graphic put out by the Des Moines Weather Service Office, and the Des Moines Weather Service Office is responsible for the central part of the state from the Minnesota uh, to Missouri border. Uh, now, what you see here are color codings for where we saw the highest winds. Wherever you see those green colors, 80 miles per hour plus, starting effectively uh, right at Carroll and then moving with the derecho as it moved into central Iowa. So you can see a stretch of intermittent, intermittent 100 mile per hour plus winds uh, moving just north of Des Moines Metro. So between Ames and Des Moines is where we saw those highest winds. And this is where we saw some of the severest damage, uh, flattened corn and beans, as along with uh, structural damage to grain bins uh, in uh, urban areas. Uh, so you can see that where you have those really tight uh, gradients of winds, that's where we have these what we call downburst, downburst clusters. And that's that really moist cold air uh, dropping down through the atmosphere because it's really dense, hits the surface and then spreads out. And that's how you get those high winds. Why a derecho is a specific and very um, a terrible beast is that those downbursts can perpetuate. So you get those downbursts continuing along a specific line. And that's where you see this linear features in the uh, uh, wind field. Now, if we go over to Eastern Iowa, you can see the preliminary wind gust estimates are around Cedar Rapids over to Clinton in excess of 120 miles per hour and above. I think we've had some readings of uh, 130 to 140 miles per hour wind. Now you've heard a lot of people comparing these winds to hurricanes. Uh, that's probably not the proper way to do it because hurricane winds are on the Saffir Simpson scale, whereas you have tornadoes on the uh, Fuji, enhanced Fujita scale. Those are rotational winds. These are not pure straight line winds, whereas a derecho is. So when you see these, these estimated wind gusts uh, above 100 miles per hour, you're getting into a pretty terrible uh, set of events in the atmosphere. Uh, this is a what we call a synthetic aperture radar. This is a remote sensing pro product. And what it shows you is uh, damage to crop. So we have satellite images of the damage to crop, and we have this radar image. This gives us an idea of the height at which uh, uh, an image is taken. So wherever you see these lighter colors, that's those striations from those high wind events. And that's where we see the largest amounts of crop damage. And you can really see at high resolution just how particular those downbursts are. You get sets of downbursts, and then within those downbursts, you have microbursts that can do extensive damage within a field, but then a wider scale, you look at the downburst features, you still have standing corn around those. And we did see these uh, during a field scouting last week, and also uh, with Megan and Secretary Nag doing um, aerial uh, photography from a Cessna. So what we initially thought of for a preliminary quick response crop at damage estimate uh, was using a, a damage polygon created from the Storm Prediction Center's wind speed uh, reports. So we overlaid those high wind events as reported by observers. And then that MODIS satellite data that I showed last week that showed um, extensive crop damage uh, from that emerald green that you would typically see from looking down with the satellite versus that blown over corn, that's that light yellow color. So with these two uh, uh, products put together, we came up with a potential damaged estimate within 36 counties of three and a half million acres of corn and two and a half million, million acres of soybeans. Now this 36 county polygon was embedded within a larger 57 county polygon. So that 57 county, a stretch from east to west was also impacted by the derecho. So these are some pictures that Megan shared with me. This is a, a farm 
and you can see out in the uh, soybean field the the extent of the debris that was blown off of the outbuildings on that that farm uh, pretty substantial damage and then you'll notice on the right here um, flattened corn so this derecho was ferocious uh, one of the most widespread and strongest that we've seen in state history uh, secondarily you look at uh, from above flattened corn fields, and then you have soybean fields, which fared a little better in terms of being lower to the ground and actually helping support uh, the individual plants because of the canopy closing in together. So yes, yeah, just substantial widespread damage that uh, I have never seen um, in that I don't think we've seen across the state. Okay, so now we'll transition uh, from the derecho into drought. And from this morning's uh, U.S. Drought Monitor for the central region, this is the map I'm showing, what we saw across the state is an, an expansion of that D1 category. D1 is moderate drought from central Iowa into the north, northeast corner of the state. We also saw an expansion of D2, uh, about a one county depth east and somewhat north uh, from the D3 extreme drought bullseye that we saw no change in. So we didn't, we didn't de degrade that any, we didn't expand it any, uh, but it is still there. And that bullseye, wherever, wherever we have co-op stations there, we're seeing anywhere from eight to 12 inches of uh, below average precipitation going out six months. Now we still consider this drought uh, short term uh, pr uh, below six months, but we can see through the Midwest, we're starting, we're starting to see dryness expand, especially into eastern Nebraska and uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and even a little bit in Illinois. Now where the storm track has been situated, it's been situated further south across Missouri and into Ohio, and they've actually seen some um, improvement in the drought monitor as shown by this one week change map. So wherever you see yellow on this map, that is where we've seen a degradation in the uh, drought category. So D0 would be degraded to D1, D1, D2. And where we saw some uh, increasing uh, D0 coverage was in Southern Iowa, especially Southeastern Iowa. So we are starting to see dryness continue to creep in into the Southern part of the state. Southern and Eastern parts of the state have been the wetter parts of the state going out uh, two to three months. Uh, we're starting to see that dryness increase. Okay, so now we'll look at recent conditions, precip deficits, the temperature over the last seven days, and then some subsoil moisture fields. Uh, the first thing I'll draw your attention to is the 30-day departure of precipitation. This is radar indicated along with uh, surface OBS. Anywhere where you see those warm colors, that's where we've been drier than average. And that bullseye is effectively over Iowa, and it's starting to spread out into Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, and into eastern Nebraska, as reflected in the, the recent drought monitor map. We are the driest part of the central United States um, for much of the United States. And what we're seeing dryness start to enhance is in that northeastern corner and eastern Iowa, which, as I said, has been the garden area for the state or the wetter area uh, going back a few months. Now, if we look at the seven day precipitation departure from last week, uh, we're seeing departures anywhere from a half, an, half of an inch to uh, two inches in Eastern Iowa, East Central Iowa. Uh, we did get some measurable rainfall from the derecho anywhere from a half inch up to three inches in Eastern Iowa. Uh, but we haven't seen any appreciable rainfalls uh, since then. So we are drying out. And as you can see across the central region of the United States, much of uh, central United States, Iowa, South Dakota, Nebraska, all the way over to Wisconsin, Illinois, and down into Arkansas, we're, we've been drier. So the storm, storm track has been where you see those, uh, those uh, greens and purples. That's where we're seeing above average rainfall. So over northern Minnesota, but also the storm track south from uh, southern Arkansas all the way over to the mid-Atlantic states. What we would like to see happen is a large-scale circulation shift that would push one of those storm tracks into uh, Iowa. So we'll kind of get that when we look at the outlooks moving forward. A statewide average temperature departure. Uh, we've been near normal for much of the state. We're, that's where you see those green or those uh, gray colors. 
If you look at uh, Eastern and Southern Iowa, we've actually been one to two degrees below average temperature wise. So we've been cooler than average. Given moisture stress out there, these cooler temperatures do help some, they do help mitigate some moisture stress, but not to the degree that widespread rainfall over a day-to-day -day basis would, would help. And that's what we really need right now. Okay, so now we'll look at subsoil conditions because these are tightly tied to the atmosphere. If you don't have rainfall to replenish the subsoil profile, you start to dry out fast. Now this is a NASA product going down to 200 centimeters, and this is a soil moisture percentile. So if you think of a sponge as 100%, uh, anything that you see red there is below average for uh, this time of year, 30% uh, uh, capacity there. So wherever you're seeing those dark, dark red colors in Southwestern Iowa and into Western Iowa, that means the sponge has 98% capacity for water. So really, really dry, two percentile. That's a near record dryness for that part of the state uh, for this time of year. So we have been dry and we keep on getting dry. Now, if we look at the departure, we call this the Delta plot. Wherever you see warmer colors here, that's where we've seen an increase in dryness since the end of July. And you'll notice that much of uh, Iowa is there. Uh, that little bullseye right in the middle, that white bullseye, was probably a reflection of the uh, heavy rainfall that we received with the derecho in central Iowa, but also a frontal passage a few days after that, where we got anywhere from uh, half an inch to an inch in central Iowa. Very localized precipitation, uh, but we did see some uh, replenishment of the subsoil profile. So eastern Iowa, as you see there with the darker colors, that's where we've, we've been seeing enhanced drying over the, over the recent term. Okay, finally, we'll look at the forecast and some uh, outlooks moving into uh, late August into uh, September. Not a lot of help from the seven day QPF. QPF is the quantitative precipitation forecast. So if you watch the news at night or in the morning or read the newspaper, we always get a daily amount of expected rainfall. Well, this is the summation over the next seven days. We do see higher probabilities of wetter or higher amounts in Western Iowa, anywhere from a, a quarter inch up to a half inch, localized maybe three quarters of an inch. But as I mentioned, the storm track is locked across the Northern tier of states. So Minnesota, Wisconsin, and then we have the tropical plume down in the Gulf of Mexico and then the mid-Atlantic states. We're stuck in between, it's, we call this a bifurcation. The flow is split around us and we really don't get any systems moving through the state. Now we are moving into uh, fall. And as we move into fall, we transition from thunderstorm based rainfall to larger scale, low pressure systems, uh, frontal systems moving through the state. So climatologically, we are moving into a more, uh, let's see, uh, hopeful stage where we we should get larger spatial scale rainfalls across the state, not these one and two inch rainfall events that you get over a five mile span and then somebody east or west of you doesn't get anything. So that's one good thing that we're seeing as we move into uh, the cooler season. Finally, if we if we look at the eight to 14 day outlooks, we're showing a higher probability of uh, cooler than average temperatures on the left there, wherever you see that blue, that's telling us that there's a signal in the forecast models suggesting that we should see cooler temperatures as we move into the last week of August into the, the first week of September. Going hand in hand with that, if we look at the precipitation field, we're also seeing an elevated signal for wetter than normal conditions. Uh, now this would help ease uh, drought concerns. This would, getting subsoil moisture in there, would start, you know, allowing for transient systems to move through the state and available low level moisture to help force those thunderstorms. Uh, but again, we've, we've got some pretty substantial deficits. We'll need synoptic scale rainfalls every few days for uh, a few months to really uh, remove those drought conditions across the state. Finally, this is the Climatology Bureau's website, Google Climatology Bureau for the state of Iowa. This will give you all those maps and a lot more information. Finally, here is my contact information. 
please shoot me an email or uh, give me a call. I'm always happy to chat and uh, provide information for you. And I'll take any questions if we have time. All right, thank you, Justin. Uh, so uh, like I just put in the chat box, anybody who has questions, please add those to the Q&A and we'll address those uh, as they come up. And as we move on to uh, next speakers, we'll, we'll catch any questions that are left at the end if, you're, if you wanna stick around for them. Um, so we will go ahead and move on to Mark Licht. And while Mark's bringing up his presentation, I'm not sure if anybody else feels this way, but I don't think I could stand to have rainfall every three days uh, for the next several months. So if it could start maybe in the middle of December or so, that'd be, or middle of November, you know, into early December, that'd be great. All right, put your order in now. Okay. All right, so moving on to Mark Licht. Uh, he is a cropping system specialist with Iowa State University on campus. And he's gonna tell us all about what we should expect for uh, making yield estimates and some fall management considerations. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into the, the making yield estimates. And so I showed this slide um, a couple weeks ago, um, you know, using the yield component method, we're really looking at how many um, harvestable ears we have, how many kernel rows um, and how many kernels per row and then uh, using an, a, a factor for kernels per bushel. So um, the, the change that I made to this slide is um, because of the derecho, um, kernel rows and number of kernels per row is still pretty easy to, do, to determine. Um, but now the ears per acre or harvestable ears per acre has um, changed for those that were in that storm path. Um, because now it's a factor of, you know, what can the combine uh, pick up? How, how much are we going to lose from ear drop uh, just as we, um, you know, progress through that harvest process? So uh, this, this method is generally a, a pretty accurate method. Um, now the hard part in a year like this where we have multiple stresses or even if you're um, in, in one of the areas or, or the other, um, is really trying to estimate out how many kernels per bushel. Um, normally we use um, 90,000 kernels per bushel um, in the drought stressed areas or if we have premature death because of uh, pinch stalks or broken stalks uh, with the derecho. You know, now we're probably talking somewhere around 100,000 or maybe even 110,000 kernels per bushel. Um, and so we, we have to make sure we make that adjustment and that's gonna be a hard adjustment to make um, just because it's a, a really hard estimate um, to look at. Um, myself, as I've been out in the, the drought prone areas, um, we may have some really good um, ear size from the perspective of the girth and the length of those ears. But when you um, compare them to what we've had in the past, um, they tend to be a little bit on the smaller side. So we have shallower uh, kernels, a little bit narrower kernels on there. Um, and so that's going to uh, affect things a little bit uh, when we make these estimates. Um, soybeans, the same type of thing, um, except for now we're switching to uh, basically figuring out how many pods per acre we have, um, how many seeds per pod, and then um, the seeds uh, per pound um, is going to be the, the hard one there. Um, again, as we look at these dry areas that haven't had much relief from rainfall, uh, we probably need to adjust the seeds per pound upwards uh, a little bit. Um, so we may now be looking at 2,900 or, or 3,000 uh, seeds per pound, or maybe even a little bit more uh, with that. Um, in the storm path area, um, it's a little bit of a challenge to, to know whether the rainfall that we got with that uh, was beneficial or outweighed um, the, the wind damage. Um, I would say that normally rains in August are good for soybean yields and good for um, getting um, the, the seed weight in there um, to help us. Um, as I've walked a, a couple soybean fields just in the last couple days, I would note that they do have a pretty strong lean to the east. Um, so if you haven't been in some soybean fields, uh, maybe check that out just to get an idea for um, what your harvest conditions might look like. Uh, and that will help you uh, maybe also adjust. Uh, the seeds per pound a little bit. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and, and get us thinking about uh, some considerations going into the fall. And so I'm going to um, hit real briefly on 
um, some cover crop plans, um, combine settings, and some thoughts on uh, where we might want to go or what we want, might want to think about uh, for fall tillage. Um, so with cover crops, um, it, especially if we're in dry areas, and, and as, Den or as uh, Justin just alluded, that's pretty much the whole state now, um, we really have to be thinking about delaying seeding until we have some good forecasted rains. Uh, if we don't have rain, that seed just will not germinate and emerge. Um, that likely means that we may want to be uh, thinking about a switch from aerial seeding to uh, either broadcast seeding or drill seeding uh, post harvest. Um, again, we probably, because of the timing of seeding getting pushed back, um, we're, we're probably limiting um, the species that we can be planting. Cereal rye right now um, is looking more and more uh, like the better choice. Um, it does overwinter quite uh, well, uh, but also if it doesn't uh, get much growth this spring, it can really uh, turn around and, uh, excuse me, if we don't get much growth this fall, we can turn around and in the spring get quite a bit of growth. Um, uh, again, if, if we're really thinking about this drill seeding or broadcasting with vertical tillage incorporation uh, may provide that seed to soil contact um, as well. When we think about the wind damaged areas, um, those non-harvested corn acres, um, I'm really thinking that the vertical tillage, disking, stalk shredding, just to size some of that corn residue, um, helping us get some light penetration down into the soil will help us with those uh, cover crops. Again, I think we're probably um, gonna maybe be delaying that seeding a little bit, uh, switching from aerial to post harvest seedings. Um, and then uh, the cereal rye and the drill seeding vertical tillage incorporation um, still fit in this wind damaged area. But largely what I'm thinking about in the wind damaged area is um, we may have to think about sizing that residue if it's not gonna be harvested. And if it is gonna be harvested, knowing that harvest is gonna be delayed a little bit on us. And so that's gonna push back um, our cover crop seeding a little bit more. So we just have to think through that, that process a little bit. As far as combine set settings, um, I'm gonna start right now, it's gonna start by setting the mentality of the operator. Um, harvest in the duratio affected area is gonna be very slow. Um, it's gonna be a mental adjustment. We're gonna have um, the, the higher risk, I'll say, of um, injury as we clean out that combine, as we're going slower, as we get fatigued. So. Uh, be patient, don't cut corners. Um, think about your own physical and mental health as you're going through and, and, and combining this fall. Um, when we think about the, the physical combine settings, um, realize in, the, in drought affected areas and severely drought affected areas that the corn stalk and ear size are, are gonna vary quite a bit throughout a field. Um, and they're gonna be probably um, narrower than normal. Um, so because of that, we have to really uh, think about um, um, uh, adjusting our um, snapper rolls. And I got uh, my things out of um, space here a little bit, but we may need to um, think about adjusting our snapping rolls down just a little bit. Um, so that way we catch those um, stalks. We're, we're keeping those ears in the, in the head. Um, with the, the, Damaged corn, we're going to need to be thinking about uh, possibility of real slowing our travel speeds down. Um, we're going to have a lot more plant material going through that combine. Um, adjusting concaves, rotor cylinders, uh, sieves, and fan speed is all going to be a, a factor of how we, we keep as much of the good quality grain in um, as we can. Although I think um, just talking to a couple of farmers, their strategy uh, might be trying to throw some of that, that lightweight um, grain. Um, out with the tailings as well. And so you might be able to, to do some things there. Um, but again, make sure that you've really focused on getting these combine settings um, fine-tuned. It's probably gonna change um, as you go from one field to the next. Um, so the, the one size fits all is, is not necessarily um, gonna be a good method this year. For fall management, um, as we look at the duratio affected areas, um, we're probably gonna need to uh, really focus on our crop rotation. I don't think we wanna go um, from corn into corn just because of the high amounts of um, volunteer corn that we have the potential for uh, going into 2021. So we probably wanna look at those corn acres going into soybeans 
uh, just because that'll be a little bit easier on the management side of things. Um, I know there's gonna be volunteer corn out there um, in, in this wind damaged area. So know what traits that corn was, know what traits you're planning to use next year and, and start making those adjustments to the herbicide program now. Um, that, that's gonna be our, our cleanest way um, to try to, to come out of this um, with, with minimal impact on it. Um, and then again, I, I'm still thinking that from a, a planting perspective, um, I think no tillage and st strip tillage can work, um, it, whether it's in the drought areas where we maybe have less biomass or even where we did have some of that crop damage. Uh, but if we're looking at a lot of biomass that did not get harvested, I think the vertical tillage and disking uh, may be a way to help us um, size some of that residue um, to help us um, get those planters through it a little bit easier going into uh, that the, the spring time frame. So a couple of considerations, a couple of things to really think about on the, the fall management. Um, I would also maybe add to this list, um, just because we're, we're focused on getting the, the crop harvested, uh, make sure that we're setting the spread pattern on those combines so that way what residue is going through the combines is getting spread across that harvest width. Um, that'll help us manage that residue uh, in the spring a little bit better as well. Okay, with that, I. I don't know if Megan, if I have any uh, time for questions, but that is the, the end of what I had planned. All right, thank you, Mark. I think that was a, a great segue really to talking about what we need to be thinking about for the rest of this growing season and, and some things that we'll wanna start thinking about for next year uh, so that we can go into Charlie here. Uh, and, and Charlie's gonna share some information about what the grain quality uh, might look like, and then Aaron Bowers is going to join him as well. Charlie Herbert is a professor in our Ag and Biosystems Engineering Department, and he uh, is a part of the Iowa Grain Quality Initiative, and he is our grain quality guru. So thanks for joining us today, Charlie. Well, thank you, Megan, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to share a few thoughts. Man, did things change in a hurry uh, in the last week or so. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm not moving ahead here. Megan? Slides are not moving. There we go. There we go. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the drought and, and which was the original focus of this program. Uh, and now the storm damage and the interaction of the storm damage with the drought uh, situation. So uh, uh, first, let's talk about the drought, which we intended to, to be the focus of the, of the quality discussion. Uh, this was, and I'm one week behind, admittedly, uh, on this drought monitor, but this was the drought monitor on August 12th. Uh, about a little less than 20% uh, of the area was in D2 and D3, and about six or so percent was in uh, D2, D3 alone, uh, which is about 5 million corn and soybean acres uh, in D2 and 3, and about 1.7 in, uh, in, the, in the D3. Uh, in those areas, basically we want to think about, in those areas, particularly the D2 and the D3, uh, we will get physical loss, that is yield reductions, but, but there, and that represents some lost bushels and then expect quality loss over the rest. And we'll go into that in just a second here. I would wanna point out that this drought area, which was essentially the original focus of our discussion, is significantly less now than the area that the storm uh, affected. It's probably 15, 20% of the area that the storm affected. And so uh, from a quality perspective, it looks as though the, the storm is gonna put more on the market and cre create more challenges. Than, uh, than, the, than the drought was planning to. Uh, to understand maybe what might, we might be looking at for, for grain quality impacts in the, in, the, uh, in the drought areas, I went back to the last drought year we had, 2012. Uh, we didn't have nearly the D3 coverage in that area, but, but it was as close an analogy as I could find. And, uh, and in that year, ironically, the yield was of course lower, uh, but ironically, the, the test weight and the protein was higher. That's because the drought in that year 
still allowed the plants to more or less finish out in a normal way with much smaller seeds. Smaller seeds usually create higher test weight because they fit in the test weight cup uh, more densely than the than the uh, than than larger ones, uh, and higher protein because smaller seeds still have the germ, and that's where the protein is. So higher protein, higher feed value, and conversely, if you go clear over to the right hand side, uh, a lower expectation of of benefit to the ethanol industry. Uh, that's sort of what I was we were expecting for this year, if the drought intensifies and gets to the point where the plant is killed very prematurely, then we might start to drop off the table, so to speak, uh, on the on the test weight and the and, and kernel filling uh, as well. But right now, overall, with perhaps the exceptions of the very, very hardest hit areas, I think we'll get a, a scenario somewhat like uh, 2000 and, uh, 2012. Uh, I didn't mention toxins. Uh, that's because Aaron, who follows afterwards, uh, will give some discussion of how the drought might create additional mycotoxin and particularly aflatoxin uh, threats. That's typically the concern as it was in 2012 uh, when you start to get long periods of drought. Soybeans, on the other hand, uh, yield less, drier in the field, uh, the oil and protein content, which is what the processors look at, uh, not in the in the aggregate, not materially different than the average. Protein probably lower because it's formed last. Oil probably higher. Again, if we get a situation where where uh, uh, soybean fields die very quickly uh, as a result of the drought, this might change. We're going to the small seeds will turn into chips. And the protein levels will, protein and oil levels both will become lower. We'll have a higher percentage of fiber and carbohydrates, which doesn't make the soybean processor very happy. Uh, at the moment, I think we're at this point with fields, yes, drying prematurely, but not uh, horridly rapidly that it would cut off the development of the oil and protein. We shall see the forecast I just heard is not exactly encouraging uh, along this route. So that's corn and soybeans in the drought. Uh, now let's look at the at the situation in the uh, storm area. And I did some very crude artwork on the picture of the, on the left there of the storm path uh, across the state and kind of estimated it at 75 miles by 280. And with that estimate, uh, you can make some estimates of, of the area that is covered. Notice that the, the uh, storm path area complete, almost completely encompasses the drought area as well. And that's the source of the statement. It's a lot larger than the drought area. And then the crosshatch in the middle are a, a kind of a freehand trace of where the uh, satellite image gave the highest crop damage. Again, I, I, this is just to kind of put things in perspective with storage loss versus versus grain loss. Uh, if we lost 25% of, of actual physical volume in the storm path area, that would be 300 million bushels or so. The estimates I've heard have gone from oh, 0,300 to 350 or 400. They all fall in that uh, in that particular range. Uh, However, all the corn in that area will have varying levels of quality loss, as we'll see in just a second. Soybeans indeed fared a little bit wet, a little bit better, and, and will be field by field variability. My belief is that those in the drought areas might give up the, you know, might give up a little bit sooner, and so we may have a little bit more impact on both seed size and oil and protein in the in the droughted areas simply because they got hit with basically two levels of stress uh, uh, relative, in a relatively close period of time. Uh, and I stole this from Megan, that uh, the, the categories of, of damage that seem to be showing up in, in corn fields, one totally dead and broken off uh, and basically have had it above the breakage site, two uh, 
perhaps pinched over, but but still still hanging on, still hanging on, root lodged, but still hanging on, and may continue to at least at least convert the sugar in the ear that they have into starch, perhaps not with a lot of additional dry matter accumulation, but at least convert the starch to the sugar to starch uh, in the ear that they have. And finally, then uh, the plants that are leaning and probably will continue at, to some extent to uh, uh, continue to develop. And we'll get to the quality here in a sec. Here's some pictures that, that kind of depict those three those three classes of, of damage that we seem to be seeing. The number one uh, gives no no more fill and 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 basically dose stage are a little bit farther uh, at best. I think we're looking at very low test weight. We're not if we don't convert sugar to starch, then for sure we're going to be looking at very low test weight, low protein, probably soft kernels, and virtually unstorable kernels. In other words, if, if any value is to be had. That would be immediate and and probably fat cattle uh, for that, but certainly very low test weights below 45 or so. And we've seen that before. It's similar to early frost uh, does the same type of thing uh, if the corn is at this at this growth stage. Uh, in the second one, in the second category, probably the plants will convert the starch, the sugar to starch uh, that they have, uh, which will make at least some usable starch in the kernels. Uh, expect small kernels, probably less than 50 pounds per bushel test weight, and the accompanying poor storage and handling characteristic. A little bit more usable, perhaps, a little bit more marketable. Uh, and finally, number three, uh, uh, better kernels yet, probably low test weight in the low 50s uh, and hard to store, but getting up to where it looks like uh, to, to look at it it looks more or less like mature corn all of them will dry down slower i imagine the moistures when the storm hit were somewhere somewhere in the 40 to 50 range uh all will have slower dry down the big problem will be the susceptibility to molding of the grain laying on the ground and and that now is probably the key concern uh, in the crop adjustment process uh, because we would rather not have to leave the grain, leave the corn, and wait and see, harvest it, and wait and see what the market will pay for it, and then make the adjustment uh, at that point. Rather not see that, because corn laying here has a very high susceptibility to molding, and depending on the weather, uh, production of various toxins. And again, Aaron will get into that a little bit more, but the point is that become it starts out as an undesirable situation and could easily become a feed or food safety issue uh, if this material lays in the field very long. There has been some some uh, changes in guidance for released this morning uh, on uh, on crop adjustment. I haven't had a chance yet to read it all completely and get and understand the the meaning, but I think it is going to give uh, adjusters more flexibility in uh, in in totaling out and and in uh, directing the, uh, the some of this down corn to a use very quickly that can can handle it and is a little more tolerant to the damage than putting it into the general marketplace. That's what we don't really want to do. Uh, recognize that any of this is not going to store very well and is not a candidate for any type of of, of long term. Uh, storage against future contracts or whatever. It's just not going to do that. Uh, we also had bins go down. Uh, and uh, here's just some short pictures or a couple pictures of commercial and farm storages. The they all have the characteristic uh, up root of the roof goes, the roof goes, and then you get this caving in of the walls as the suction of the wind over the, over the empty bin uh, pulls one of the sides in, and that, that's a typical failure pattern for, for wind. There's not a lot of estimates yet on, the, on how much storage was lost. Uh, one DTN story estimated uh, 50 million bushels of commercial storage was gone, and 
and maybe about that much or so uh, on farm storage, the bigger bins were hit uh, much more so than the smaller ones uh, because, the, because of the down circulation it tend and then down and back up that tended to haul the pull of roofs off of taller structures and and take the bigger ones first you can see some small ones in that picture there that don't even uh, that doesn't don't even show much damage uh, the point of this is that even if this if the dtn report is right and even if we had 150 million bushels of commercial of storage total lost uh, the losses for, for storage structures are smaller than the grain, more than likely. And so my point being, we're probably not going to have a storage shortage, although it will be out of position. Obviously, an elevator that's totally out is going to have to move grain to some other location or make an outdoor pile. So expect... The, the basis at individual elevators to be a little bit variable uh, because of the additional movement of grain around to get it into decent storage. But overall, in the aggregate, I wouldn't look for us to uh, be uh, any more short on storage than we would have been before. We were headed for some storage shortages uh, with, with a huge crop. We were headed for some storage shortages already, but this did not make the storage shortage situation any worse, I don't believe. Uh, but also the bottom line for sure, uh, the quality of the grain will be poor and corn and, and will be poor. And so I wouldn't expect to keep it very long. Pile grain particularly will have some pretty short uh, shelf life and need, it needs to be moved to uh, locations that can use it. We're hoping that that we can redirect much of the that category one grain that is below 45 pounds per bushel. We're hoping that that can be redirected to, if if harvested at all, to uh, uses that can deal with it, primarily beef cattle in some level, and not to general market to be mixed in with the with the with corn from other locations. That, that is better. We just as soon get those feed safety hazards off of the market. In, to the end of this, or to, to summary, uh, adjust the corn quickly, uh, soybeans too, as a matter of fact, eliminating fields that should not be harvested. Uh, that, that, that we can do a lot by taking out and not trying to harvest uh, fields. That has to do with the crop insurance, of course, but, but taking that very light test weight grain off the market. Field bowl conditions will change with weather. That means that, that if the adjustment happens three or four weeks later, if you happen, if that's the time before it's harvested, uh, that will, the, the conditions will change. Readjust or re have the adjuster uh, take another look. Uh, I believe that they will have asked for, should have asked for uh, check strips uh, if, they, if the harvest is going to be much later. But pay attention to that because conditions will change. And where we probably don't have mold now, uh, scout for it. You probably will see it at the time of harvest. The goal here is to keep feed safety hazards out of the commerce. Uh, drought and storage, storm damage both will create storage risks. It's not going to be a real storable year for us. But there probably will be as much enough storage if not in the right place. Uh, expect transportation costs and so forth to move things around to get it into right places. Don't hold it wet, uh, dry it very quickly and cool it as, as soon as possible. I would add also that, uh, that slow drying methods or turning the heat down on bin dryers is not a good thing. Uh, you, we wanna get the corn to a low moisture uh, as quickly as possible and not have it sit warm waiting to be dried. And that, that will be a, a, a very problematic situation this year. Uh, and it's not suitable for long periods of, of, uh, of grain storage for sure. So with that, uh, with that summary, uh, there's our website and there's contact information and so forth in there. Uh, and we will be posting updates um, as they come out.
All right, thank you, Charlie. Um, so while we're switching over to Aaron, Aaron is gonna address some of our um, mycotoxin concerns that we might have in, in uh, both drought areas and in storm damage areas, but in particular in some of these areas where we have an overlap and now we've got both problems. Uh, but while we're switching over to Aaron, we did have a question come in um, about how would fields be handled that are not harvested? And I'm wondering if maybe Mark Licht might uh, be a good person to address that right now while we're switching over. So as far as uh, how to handle those, those fields, um, I think the first thing is realizing that you have a lot of material um, that is intact. And so that uh, goes back to where I was talking about uh, probably wanting to do some sort of uh, vertical tillage or disking or, or shredding of that stock just to size that. Um, that will help with the residue decomposition, but it will also um, help with uh, the planter being able to go through it a little bit easier um, in, the, in the spring. All right, thank you, Mark. If anybody has any follow-up questions or any more questions for our speakers, go ahead and stick them in the Q&A uh, and we'll address, we'll address them at the end so you can stick around as long as needed to get your questions answered. Uh, but we will move on to Aaron Bowers right now. Uh, Aaron is an assistant an associate scientist and an assistant professor on campus and she is an expert in uh, mycotoxins and uh, green quality. So thanks for joining us today, Aaron. Glad to be here, and I'll try to keep my comments uh, moving as quickly as possible. I know we're reaching the end of our hour. So we thought we were going to be talking strictly about drought and mycotoxins, but of course we got thrown another curveball, and the severe weather will also impact some of the risks that we have to, to think about in regards to our mycotoxin issues. Uh, so mycotoxins uh, are chemical compounds that are produced by some fungi. Uh, not all fungi produce mycotoxins. Those fungi that do, do not always do so after they infect a crop. That's an important thing to note. Um, but mycotoxins have negative impacts on human health and on animal health and productivity. And so it's important to be mindful of how they are being um, included or not included, excluded in feeds, especially for specific species. They are worldwide contaminants, not only of grains, but of other, other, uh, other products like nuts and spices, uh, just to name a few. Uh, what I will say, climate and weather conditions are significant determinants of fungal risk and therefore mycotoxin risk. And oftentimes the climate conditions at certain crop development periods, uh, specific times during crop development can also be uh, a determinant of that risk. So typically we worry about five principal mycotoxins in our cereal grains. With drought, usually we are on, on guard for aflatoxin issues. Aflatoxins are produced by uh, the Aspergillus uh, flavus and Aspergillus parasiticus fungi, primarily in our area. Um, that fungus really likes hot, dry conditions. And when we say hot, uh, you can see the uh, temperature denoted in parentheses is 95 degrees. That's the optimum fungal growth temperature for those Aspergillus species. I will also point out uh, fumonisin, which would be our fusarium ear rot disease. Uh, fumonisins are also another group of mycotoxins that are, have negative impacts on animal health and, and human health. And uh, you can see the principal producing species there, uh, like still the hot, warm to hot conditions, uh, the optimal fungal growth temperature is a little bit lower than that for aspergillus. So depending again on how these climatic events and weather events happen within the context of certain crop development periods that can impact the amount of risk that we're seeing. So of course we have to consider mycotoxins. Uh, you know, we thought just with drought being on guard for aflatoxin, but we've got this derecho, which has thrown us another curveball, like I said. And so, we have to be mindful of the fact that damaged crops, especially those laying down um, or damaged by hail, by the winds, can be more susceptible to fungal infections. And so uh, it's important to have our guard up and be out looking for our risks. So I thought I'd bring up, like Charlie did, the um, last high risk year we had for aflatoxin in 2012. And so this is unpublished data uh, from 
a survey that was conducted that year. Um, but you can see just uh, divided out by the different crop reporting districts, what our average aflatoxin level was in corn from that year. I will also point out though, if you look over to the right, you can see another map of Iowa with the, the uh, red and orange. And what that and the uh, lower orange and yellow are showing are the conditions in July of that year. So uh, the, the red was showing our really hot areas in July 2012, and the orange was showing our uh, drier, our drier areas. So I think what we can look at here is, of course, you see in, you know, far southwest where we had the most problem was where that really hot and dry overlap the most. So I'll just point that out. Um, hot and dry, again, is what that aspergillus fungus likes. And so those are the areas that had to be really careful about uh, watching what the levels in their grain were. So aside from pointing that out, I'll just share what we're seeing this year so far. And so these maps of Iowa that are larger are showing uh, essentially the 90 day um, temperature in the upper left and then the 90 day precipitation departure from normal in the lower right. And they're just side by side with, with what you can see from 2012. So it gives you a little, a little ability to do some comparing. So with the outlook that we have too, I would say, you know, we are, um, we continue to dry out but we're not as hot as we were in 2012. Um, however, I do think there are pockets uh, that are, are probably going to have to be on guard. So field scouting for ear rats, um, I think it's important to get out and know what your issues are. You're already looking for storm damage. Um, it's time to get out also and start looking for some of these ear rots. Uh, and it's probably time to do this not just once, but since the corn is in pretty rough shape, to be doing this regularly because fungi are living things and they're going to keep growing and changing as the uh, climate and weather patterns allow. So just a, a, an idea of how you might do some field scouting. We're looking at random assessment of about 100 ears in a field, say. Uh, choose five different locations and about 20 ears at each location and peel back the husks and look at the whole ear. I put up a couple of pictures here, and the left is aspergillus ear rot, kind of that olive green powdery mold. Um, you might see it in the silks, you might see it on, on the ear itself. Um, but then to the right, there are two images of fusarium ear rot, which would be the ear rot associated with humanison issues. Uh, so this would be a white to pink mold. Um, it would be scattered over lots, over kernels throughout the ear, uh, which is different from uh, the gibberella ear rot that uh, tends to grow kind of in a sheath down the ear. Another feature you might see with the fusarium ear rot that produces fumonisins would be the starburst type kernels, like you're seeing in the far right image. If you get out and scout and you are suspecting that you're having significant uh, fungal issues in the field. Um, I think, you know, in the past we've kind of had a, you know, 10% being a, a trigger point um, for taking some action. Uh, this year it might even be lower. I, I would say it's a year to be conservative for sure. Um, but you would probably want to contact insurance prior to harvesting your field, especially in the case of aflatoxin. Um, aflatoxin uh, in, it historically has been an insurable loss, but the crop still has to be standing in the field uh, when the assessor comes. So just be aware of that. I think uh, your scouting is going to be a key and it's going to be something to repeat throughout the, the rest of the year. Be conscious too of sensitive end users. It's not like we can just take all this problematic mycotoxin grain and, and throw it at a single end user. Um, there are a variety of issues. Um, mycotoxins, you know, we have a large ethanol, ethanol industry in Iowa and mycotoxins concentrate three times in dried distillers, grains and solubles. And so anything, you know, whatever level of mycotoxin is in the original corn 
is going to be three times, uh, it will be three times that in the DDGs that are produced from that corn. And so that's uh, something to be really mindful of for ethanol producers. Also, aflatoxin is an adulterant. And so um, blending, blending grain with the express purpose and intention of reducing the aflatoxin concentration in that grain lot to sell into a more sensitive market is illegal. So be mindful of that. Uh, glass of milk up there because uh, there are different, actually I'll just go to my next slide here. In livestock feeding, we have uh, action levels from the FDA on um, feeding out aflatoxin contaminated grain or, or uses that it's appropriate for and limits for those uses. You'll notice um, finishing beef cattle tend to be the most tolerant. They can tolerate up to 300 parts per billion in the corn, whereas dairy uh, is lower. It's not because the animals are different uh, and, and the aflatoxin is different. It's because uh, by keeping the limit uh, for aflatoxin at 20 parts per billion for dairy cattle, that is one way that we can protect our our milk supply because aflatoxin uh, is metabolized, a metabolite of aflatoxin, excuse me, is actually excreted into cow's milk or, or dairy milk. And so uh, we need to minimize the level in dairy feed so that we can be protective of, of, the, of the human food supply and, and watching for that. So you can see there are a variety of, of levels at which the grain that's contaminated with aflatoxin can be safely used, but it's important to know that it's not just something that can be um, fed out kind of uh, willy-nilly. We have to be really careful. The same for fumonisins. There also are guidance levels from the FDA on uh, feeding out fumonisin contaminated grain. And uh, it looks fairly similar to the aflatoxin, not in level, of course, but in structure. So there's different species, different levels. The only thing to be mindful of is you'll see on this that it's given as the feed ingredient and then the portion of diet that 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 can be com comprised of essentially. So, so for example, for horses, which would fall in that equids, um, you may have a five part per million contaminated corn, um, but that is not to exceed 20% of the diet. So in essence, your finished feed shouldn't exceed one part per million. So that's how you interpret those uh, recommendations. So I would say scouting right now is your most um, effective proactive measure. And if you see significant mold, it's a good idea to call insurance or recall, recontact insurance if they've made you, uh, if perhaps you've been sitting on the field waiting to see what happens. Charlie just indicated that there's been some improved guidance from RMA, which may help us in this regard. Um, but what I will say is that it's not getting any better, especially in damaged and downed corn. So, so be mindful that you may need to be watching it. You may need to be, need to be scouting multiple times. Um, send a representative sample for testing. The only way you can you know, fall within those safe limits is if you know what the level is in the grain that you're trying to feed out. And so there are a number of places that you can send. Our Iowa State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab is one that can run, run mycotoxin tests. There's also a number of other um, commercial labs that can run these mycotoxin tests. I believe on our iowagrain.org website, there is a fairly updated list of uh, a directory of labs that do mycotoxin testing. And so feel free to look for that. Uh, what you wanna do though too, if you have significant issues and, and you're in affected corn is you wanna harvest it as soon as it's dry enough and you have a means to handle it and dry it immediately and store it or market it. You are not getting any gains by letting it sit out there. Uh, if we look back at another weather event that was in 2009, there was a significant hail event in uh, West Central Iowa. And um, that damaged grain, of course, uh, the longer it sat in the field, the moldier it got. And of course, we also saw, which you may see this year too, um, multi, you know, you might see lots of different types of molds in an individual field, which also might indicate you have different types of mycotoxins, not just one. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. You can have multi mycotoxin contamination in a single sample. It's, it's fairly common to have that. So 
Again, um, as soon as it's dry enough, harvest it because the longer it sits, the more mold is going to grow. Um, but make sure you don't just harvest it wet and then let it sit because that is even in sound, you know, sound grain that might have uh, a fungal issue in a normal year, letting wet grain sit uh, waiting to be dried is not very good practice for, from a mycotoxin perspective. Even in a week's time, mycotoxins can increase significantly uh, in wet grain that's just waiting to be dried. So, so make sure you have a way that you can handle and deal with it quickly rather than just letting it sit around um, once you harvest it. So again, as, as Charlie stated, this is not the year for low temperature or air drying of stressed grains. The, um, you know, you, you look at that optimum temperature that Aspergillus splavus likes and it, that fungus likes and it was 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can imagine what that, that type of drying would do over a number of days. It can act as an incubator for that type of fungus in essence. So this isn't the year to be looking at that as a reasonable strategy. Um, and I will say you want to dry it uh, one to two percentage points lower than for sound grain. Uh, if you have affected grain, it will keep better. Uh, and then um, going along with what Mark said too, um, you want to have a gentle harvest, the gentlest harvest and handling practices you can. That will help you save what you've got. But mechanical injury can just predispose, you know, harvested kernels to fungal invasion. And so if there's you know, fungal spores sitting on the surface of that grain, and then it's been mechanically damaged during harvest or handling. It's an easy way for it to just get into the main part of the kernel and start uh, continuing to prol proliferate and damage it more. So all I'll say in closing is nothing about this year has been normal. It's going to hold true through harvest and marketing of your grain. So hang in there and just expect it to be a, a challenge. And this is sad to say, but expect it to be a challenging year, but moving faster is not going to help you in a lot of sense from a harvesting perspective, um, make sure you have a plan and a place for this stuff to go. Um, that's, that's a proactive measure you can start working on right now is, is figuring out a, a strategy. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, there will be continued uh, updated resources available through iograin.org. Uh, you can also check the Crop Protection Network uh, website provided there or the extension website, Iowa State Extension website for some uh, different updates. Also methods, if you're looking at scouting methods, there is a document on the Crop Protection Network. Um, there are documents there about specific ear rot diseases. And um, so it can be, there's some really good resources out there for you. And of course, um, my email is provided below, erin at iastate.edu, and feel free to reach out. Mark, we saw a comment come in that was that had some really good tips uh, for harvesting, and and I was wondering if maybe you just wanted to run through a couple kind of best management practices uh, for for harvesting some of the. I mean, maybe right drought areas alone are going to be managed differently than some of this crop that's down, but but some best management practices for making sure that we can actually, you know, get what's out there harvested. Yeah. So I. I already mentioned kind of the making sure you have the combine set properly um, but I think um, the other part of this is um, and, and Aaron mentioned this as well um, just getting out there and harvesting it as quickly as you can uh, maybe I should say as early as you can <laughs> I think it's going to be a slow process um, but making you know that harvest early is going to be the key so that way we don't have further degradation of the quality um, I know um, that the longer this stays out there, we're gonna have more ear drop. Um, we're gonna have the stalks deteriorating uh, faster. And so getting out there ahead of that um, will help pick up as much of it as, as we can think about or being able to. Um, and then um, putting a reel on the combines will help pick up some of that, that corn as well. Um, finger sensors to help uh, um, in, in the guidance systems, right? Can help us stay on track. Um, so making sure that those are working properly will help reduce some uh, fatigue. Um, and then there's some different thoughts as far as running the combine uh, perpendicular to the direction of the lodge corn. Um, and, and, and that definitely can help uh, just because um, you're, you're feeding it in rather than trying to pull it in uh, type thing. So those are all um, great points. Uh, some that I elaborated on and added and others that uh, one of the participants put in the, the question box so 
Yeah, that was fantastic. Okay, so we got a, a good question here that's the million dollar question. Uh, what's the yield expectation for the area? It says area on average for all of Iowa, right? So we now have all kinds of issues <laughs> going on across the state. So anybody want to toss out a number? If I knew I would not be working for Iowa State. <laughs> USDA will put the states in their crop estimates, I think, the next time. So we'll, we'll stay tuned, right? It'll, it'll be kind of a wait and see. Uh, we do have one more here that's, uh, will soybean stems dry down normally, or do we have a risk of dropping pods at this point, especially on these more stressed soybeans? So I, I don't think we'll drop any pods at this point, especially if they've been filling. Um, usually once we have um, pods that are filling and, and have seed filling occurring, um, those pods usually hold on, and obviously, unless we have um, uh, hail injury or something like that. Um, as far as the plants being able to stand and, and stay standing, um, they are already leaning um, in, in the storm damaged area. Um, that usually does not bode well for um, the stems going into harvest. Um, so I, I would keep an eye on those fields in particular. Um, if, if they do start lodging and falling over, then that's a sign that you, you might need to move a little quicker than you normally would have. All right, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to stick them in that Q&A box. Otherwise, I will ask um, one more and uh, it's, it's probably gonna be of Mark. So I've heard, you know, we all know that on these fields that are down uh, and or have excessive stress that that our stock integrity is going to be sacrificed and we probably need to be out there earlier um, harvesting that crop wetter than we we probably would like to in a in a normal year. Um, but for what about for somebody who has a crop that looks pretty good right now, uh, but is maybe leaned over? Uh, and maybe some of that stock integrity has been sacrificed, whereas they've got other crop that's maybe closer to the ground. Do you have any thoughts on harvest order? Should we be prioritizing the fields that we think are probably not going to get a crop insurance payment uh, versus uh, some of these ones that, that are flat on the ground? So I, I generally think that harvesting the crop of highest value first is probably going to be the key. Um, you know, in a normal year, the longer we let the crop out there, the, the less stock integrity, the more eardrop we have. Um, so if you if you have fields that are not affected, um, you, you may let them sit out there a little bit and, and benefit from in-field dry down. Um, but when they're ready to be harvested, you know, those are probably the ones that you want to take just because they're, well, they may have a, less of an insurance uh, uh, implication for harvesting those. They, they're going to probably give you the highest value, right? Um, the, the corn that's laying out there likely will still be laying out there. We Yes, we may still have more eardrop. Uh, yeah, we may have um, compromised integrity, but it's still going to be in relatively the same situation. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Dr. Herber and Dr. Bowers as well. Uh, for joining us today, and thanks to Brent Fringnitz for running. Uh, he's the magician behind the show that let this happen. Uh, these will be posted again online, and thank you everybody for joining us. Don't hesitate to reach out to any of our speakers or, or any of us here at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach uh, as you've got questions and as we try to approach this, this challenging harvest season. Uh, have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.